And so people who follow this process now can magically raise $250,000 in three days. Yeah, because I did all the work up front. Mm. And that is a, a much, much more stress-free way to raise capital. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of having Michael Blanc on the podcast today. For those of you that don't know who Michael is, he's the leading authority on apartment building investing in the United States. He's passionate about helping others become financially free in three to five years by investing in apartment deals. To date, through his investing company, Nighthawk Equity, he controls over $64 million in multifamily assets. In addition to his own investing activities, He's helped students purchase over 5,000 units valued at over 215 million through his content and training programs. And I'm a bit of a fanboy here. How's it going, Michael? How you doing? Jesse, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming, uh, for coming on the podcast. Um, like we were talking about before, um, everybody in real estate seems to have, like superheroes, some origin story, where they started in real estate, how they broke in, and ultimately why real estate. Love to talk to you about what yours was and, and how that journey, uh, how the journey was for you. Yeah, I'm a slow learner, Jesse. I, I, I kind of consider myself the tra- crash test dummy of financial freedom because when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2004, it really threw me for a loop because I thought I was a pretty smart guy, had it all figured out. And, uh, you know, my entire financial plan was all predicated on how much you can stuff into the bank, maybe how much salary you make. And so, um, I, I, so my, I, I eventually quit my, my job because I had a bunch of money from a software IPO. I have a software background and I decided I was going to parlay my IPO millions into a friend, into a passive income. My big idea though was restaurants. And this is only because I was surrounded by people who were, you know, franchisees and they're like, Oh, you hire a guy and they run everything and you just count, sit back and count the passive income. I was like, sweet. As personally passive. Now, long story short, it didn't work out that way. The recession changed my plans and subsequently lost my IPO millions, added a couple hundred thousand dollars on top of debt on top of that, almost lost my house, and then clawed my way out with real estate. And like so many people, when they think real estate investing, they think single family house, landlording, flipping, wholesaling, whatever. In my case, it was flipping. So, uh, I, and, and so this is where I also discovered the art of raising money because I didn't have any. And so I started raising money to, to do house flips. So we flipped about three dozen in, in three years and it was, it was fabulous. It really allowed me to get out of the, uh, um, to get out of the hole that I was in. Um, the problem is it wasn't really financial freedom. It really wasn't what I had uh, hoped. It was a very active, uh, active job and exciting, but very active. You know, I, I can't take 30 days off or, which I, you know, I do with my family. Can't, I can't do that. So I kind of accidentally got into apartment buildings. First of all, let me say this. I started learning about apartment buildings in 2006, back in the day when I was doing everything at the same time. I quit my job. So I, I actually started sending out letters and making phone calls for about nine months and got really close to a deal when I kind of pulled back uh, and, and decided I was going to pursue the, the restaurant route as misguided as it was, but accidentally got into an apartment building. One of my wholesalers brought it to me and I kind of was like, oh, I dusted off the old stuff and analyzed it. I was like, oh, so I finally got into that. It was a nightmare. Let me tell you, the first deal was a nightmare. Eventually it quieted down and stabilized and it got really boring. And so I lost a little interest. And so I noticed that this apartment was sending me mailbox money while I was flipping houses. And I was like, man, yeah, I should just do more of that and less of this. And that's kind of when I started shifting around. And that's when I started blogging about on the bigger pockets. Mm. And, uh, and other people started asking me, well, how do you raise money? How do you put deals together? And, uh, and today we have, you know, an educational platform that teaches people how to raise money to buy apartment buildings so that they become financially free. Gotcha. So, you know what, that's not uh, dissimilar from some of the guests that have come on that they've started in kind of the the flipping world. And, you know, like you said, it's great. It's interesting. You can make a lot of money. Um, and one thing I think that's great about it is you make large lump sums of money. Um, you had the IPO, but for most people, that's that's not a typical way to, to create capital. Um, and it looks like you parlayed that. So I remember, you know, this is, again, going years back, um, you know, you had some some content out and it, it talked about the, the kind of the move from single family home into multi-res. Uh, and, you know, just cause you have a few single family properties, all of a sudden, you know, you have credibility for the multi-family side. Maybe you could talk about a little bit about how that, that step that, you know, if you do have a few investment properties, you want to be moving into the multi-residential side, you know, holding syndication, you know, aside for now, but if you wanted to take that step, you know, what, what would you say to those type of investors? 
I was su- surprised, Jesse, how little credit I got for my house flipping days. I called a broker and they're like, yeah, Michael, but the, what apartments have you done? I was like, I, I haven't, but look at all the houses I flipped. And they're like, yeah, tell me again when you've done a deal. Like that was the kind of reaction. I was like, huh? I was shocked. Yeah. And when, you know, when I talk about financial freedom and that apartment is, is the number one to do that, people kind of nod their head and then they go, yes, but I don't have the experience. And I don't have the money. I don't have the experience. And so in their mind, this is what it does. The, the narrative, it goes, I don't have the experience. So let me get it. So let me landlord or flip for five to 10 years. And then I'll take the money I make and I will then invest it in, in apartments. And that's not a bad plan. It's better than the average person who invests in the stock market and hopes to retire at 65. But it is unnecessary. You, mm. In fact, you don't need prior real estate ex- experience and you don't need your own money because it's relatively easy to overcome both of them. And, and therefore, if you so choose, you can bypass a single family house investing. And let me just say people who are listening, watching this, if they're single family house investing, and they got a good thing going, don't put a bullet in it right now, kind of like you wouldn't quit your job tomorrow, you would maybe start us up on the side and see how it goes and possibly transition over it. But the thinking typically is that multifamily investing is an advanced strategy that will take decades to get to. Yeah, for sure. And you know, one thing that's coming up again and again, um, just given the fact, you know, prior to everything that's been going around, uh, just been going on right now, uh, was the fact that, you know, there are markets that people are in that they just think it's, it's not, not only is it unattainable in a, in a say 18 hour city, you know, a, a periphery city, but you have these very expensive, uh, cities you have very expensive real estate. What, what is your advice for, for, um, investors when they're trying to find assets and they think that they can't afford it. Cause you and I both know that the first thing, you know, the first time somebody th- hears a multi-residential price, 5 million, 10 million, two, it could be 2 million. And it just pulls them so far out of their comfort zone that exactly like you said, they, they think that it's a 20 year plan where oftentimes it doesn't have to be. I had my big aha moment uh, when I was flipping houses and I, I was like, this was like in, right after the recession and in the retail market was trying to recover. This was in the, in the Washington DC area. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get me some of that. You can buy a house for 85, put 35 in and sell it for 185. I'm like, dude, I need to get me this. The problem is I don't have any money. It was all deployed. It wasn't lost yet, but it was all deployed in the restaurants. Yeah. And my big aha moment was when someone said, yeah, I'll loan you $50,000. And I was like, you will. <laughs> and I realized that you could do something regardless of your financial situation and even people with money will eventually run out of money. Therefore, the art of raising money is, a, is really allows you to be a true entrepreneur, allowing you to create something from nothing. And raising money is an example of that by pooling together resources from, from private investors who are dying to, to find a stable return and cash flow and tax advantage, which are not getting in a, in a stock market. They're like, oh, really, you have those things and it's legal? Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore, you know, you get 10 guys and gals together investing whatever, $50,000 each, and now you have $500,000 to buy a $2 million building with. And it's amazing. So you mm-hmm. start small, anything, start 50000 200000 doesn't matter. By the time you're done, you're raising millions of dollars in a matter of days and you're buying $20, 30000000 million projects. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good segue into syndication. Um, you know, we talked a little bit before the show, uh, you know, a lot of people, even in our space, they have kind of a superficial understanding of what a syndication is, but maybe not kind of a, a thorough understanding of, of the, the basic kind of structure of the syndication and who the players are. And, you know, you hear stuff in, you know, in the news or you hear on YouTube, I raise a hundred million, 200, 500. Then it, it almost starts, stops losing meaning for people that, haven't even taken down their first apartment building. So maybe you could talk about, you know, simply what a syndication is and why, if you believe this is true, why you think it's, if not the best model, but one of the best platforms to uh, invest in apartment buildings. Yeah, syndication really is, is, the, is, is the activity of pooling resources from multiple individuals together. And that could be monetary, but also could be sweat equity or operations, right? So, you know, you have five investors putting in $50,000 and they are passive investors, Sometimes we refer to them as limited partners, though that's not necessarily correct, but let's call them limited partners. It's limited because their exposure is limited only to amount of money to invest. And they want to invest because they want to be passive investors. They don't want to be active investors. And then they are the active investors. They are all sometimes called the operators or sponsors. And those are the people who are doing all the work. 
So those are the two parties really. And the active investors or sponsors or operators are finding a deal, they're closing the deal, they're signing the loan docs, they're managing the deal, hopefully they're doing a good job and they're selling it for, for a profit down, down the road. So the partnership is perfect because a lot of these past investors want to be passive. They're, you know, high income earners, they're busy, they're attorneys, doctors, and uh, they don't have a lot of time, but they have money. What, what mm. are they going to do with that money? Well, people are scratching their head around the stock market. They go, isn't there anything else? Uh, yes, there is. And it's syndications. And they're, they're wonderful because they're much more stable. They're actually, the return is higher than the stock market, believe it or not. And the risk profile is much more attractive than any other investment out on the planet. Plus you get cash flow and the tax benefits are at this point with the bonus depreciation, mm probably the most tax advantaged investment on, on the planet. So what, we're, what syndicators have is they have, they have what's arguably the best investment vehicle on the planet. The only reason not everyone's doing it is people just, not everybody knows about it, right? So people are investing in the stock market. They've always done it. Their financial advisor tells them to do it. Their CPA, their mom, their dog. And so when you come to them with something like a syndication, it sounds complicated. You know, and a confused mind says no. So we collectively have to educate investors about what, what syndications are First of all, they're legal, why they're good, and how they work. Hmm. So in terms of, just for context, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the last time I checked, the private placement or private equity um, market size is something like $4 trillion in, in the United States, um, which you know, out of a $20 trillion uh, GDP, it's quite a substantial part of the market. The, the thing I, I caught that in that stat that I found interesting was I was talking to a sponsor, and they were saying that the majority of those deals are happening around the two to th- two to $3 million mark. And that kind of blew my mind that you think these are all just unachievable $500 million deals, yeah. but he was um, also an attorney and he was basically saying, this is the, this is where I, you know, my sandbox where I play in. So let's do two things here. Let's take from the GP or the sponsor's point of view. Um, and then we'll go into the passive investor's point of view. So if I am, say you've bought a couple apartment buildings and now you want to start getting more capital. Like you said, it's only a matter of time before you, before you run out of capital. You know, what do you tell that person about getting the credibility um, to move into the syndication space as a, say, a general partner or a sponsor? Well, the first thing you got, you got to do, regardless of, of when you're calling brokers or talking investors, there's two things you have to do. You have to educate yourself. That's number one. You have to sound like you know what you're talking about. It's like when you pick up the game of golf or you go sailing right? If you use stupid words, people will treat you like an idiot because you don't know what you're talking about. So you have to use a, f- a few words, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing with, uh, with, with multifamily investors. You have to educate yourself so you use the right words. And then number two, you have to build a team. And this is a little different than a single family house investing space, especially on a smaller scale. It's just kind of you and you and you. And there's your team. And, and with multifamily investing, you know, if it's just you, it's going to be a problem. And so on the team, the two players that you need on the team uh, um, immediately is a property manager and a lender. And you need both, not just for buying apartments and managing, but you need them to buy, uh, they actually acquire prop, uh, the actual property. But more importantly, in the beginning, it lends credibility to yourself, right? So if you're calling a broker or investor and say, oh, I'm working with property management company XYZ to manage 3,000 units in Atlanta. And... I have a lender, she's done 500 billion of whatever. And I have my SEC attorney, my CPA, and I have a, an advisor on, on board. And people are like, oh my gosh, this guy's super serious, right? And it takes away that objection. Oh, well, you've never done a deal before. Like it doesn't come up because, well, your property manager's done deals before, your SEC attorney's done deals before. And so <laughs> that's- you can't, you can't all be new. <laughs> it can't all be new, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so and, and if people are willing to work with you, then obviously you're doing something right. So it, it, it goes a long way. And this is what I'm saying. This is why five or 10 years of single family house activity, uh, while great, is unnecessary because you can assemble a team in 30 days. You can educate yourself uh, to a reasonable level in 30 days. Now, it doesn't make you a guru, okay? But that's not what's required. It's required that you have a minimum amount of skill and a minimum amount of confidence as you approach people. And so it's the same thing true with, with investors. Mm. And, and it's, you know, people are like, oh, I don't, I don't like to take money from people, especially friends and family. Oh, I, I don't want to do that. Oh, that's dumb. That's who you know. It's your sphere of influence. The difference is that you're not trying to sell anything, okay? It's not like you're cold calling people and you're trying to manipulate them into investing with you. All you're doing is you're sharing your enthusiasm about this, this newfound thing that has been there for a long time, but you just discovered it, so it's new to you. Mm. You know, you're like, you're not going to believe it. I'm getting into apartment buildings and, man, these returns are for investors are great. They're between 10 and 15%. You get cash flow. You don't actually hardly pay any taxes on it. And you just share your excitement with people. And then you say, well, do you know anyone? And they're like, 
uh, me or, <laughs> oh, my brother or my dad or my, you know, my boss. And so you're, you're just sharing your enthusiasm of what you just discovered. And the people who are interested in that uh, are going to want to find out more. And the people who are interested are the ones who have money to invest and have typically done the stock market and are scratching their head. People who don't have money are not going to care. Okay. Mm. People who are arrogant about the stock market, it's the only way. They're not going to care either. Okay, that's fine. You're just going to move on. But it's really about sharing your enthusiasm with people. And then you begin to attract people. And it's the, I talk about the law of the first deal all the time. When you do your first deal, the second and third follow uh, in rapid almost autom automatic succession. It's the same thing with investors. Once you get your first verbal commitment, they'll go, yeah, if you find me a deal like that, I'll, I'll do 50,000. Mm. All of a sudden, your confidence level goes way up. And, and your second and third become much easier. And so that's how you start the process of, uh, of raising money. So from that process, one of the things that, you know, I, one of the reasons I, I want to have you on was talking about demystifying some of these things that people talk about when you actually engage in that process. You know, you hear private placement memorandum, you hear tie up the deal first, then find the money. So in terms of the actual uh, chronology of getting the investor, finding the deal or finding the deal and bringing the investor, you know, what is the way that you approach it? You know, I know, you know, just going online, you've, you've done this, a f you know, a few times in how you sequence that, but uh, maybe you could talk about that and talk a little bit about that, that deal pack that, you know, I don't know how many years ago, the first time you did that was, but uh, maybe you could talk us through that process. Yeah. I mean, you're skirting around the chicken egg problem and go something like this. Hey, I have a deal under contract and I got 45 days to close. It's not enough time for me to raise money. Yep, that's true. Mm. That's going to be stressful. Some people do it. I don't <laughs> recommend it. Then the yeah. other ones, well, I don't have a deal on a contract, so I can't raise money. Yep, also true. They're like, see, can't be done. I'm like, well, okay. Well, hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on. So you, you, you mentioned this deal pack. It's called a sample deal package. The sample deal package is a tool. Uh, it's a conversation piece, and it's really an investor package from the deal that you don't own. Mm. Okay? Now, you tell your investors this, but the point is you get a real deal from a broker, and these, you know, these marketing packages sometimes are really awesome. They have the financials in there. They have about the market. And, and so you reuse all that information uh, and, and you present that to your investors and you explain it to them. You say, here's the returns, here's the risks, here's the process. And then they start asking you big high level questions like, well, why should I invest in multifamily? Why should I invest with you? They ask all these big questions that might take an hour to answer. Or maybe even some people require even more. And so you do that with a sample deal package and you would give them that this deal package. Say, okay, well, here's a sample deal package. If I had a, if this were real, I'd give you something that looks substantially like this. Look it over, call me in the next few days and ask your questions. Mm. And so they're asking the big questions, they're asking big questions. They get comfortable with the idea. They get comfortable with reading these investor packages. So that let's say three months later, you get a live deal. And you do have 45 minutes to close and now things move really quickly. You call up your I, investors and go, hey, remember I that? hope that's days, not 45 minutes. That 45 days, yes, that's yeah. really fast. That would be a new record. Anyway, 45 days. Yeah. Thank you for that. 45 no days. And now you call your investors and you say, hey, remember that deal? Well, I got a live one. Great. Send me the deal package. You send the deal package. looks a lot like the other one. And now they're not asking you big questions like, well, why should I invest in multifamily? What are the risks? Hmm. Oh, why should I invest with you? What's your team like? They already got it out of the way. Now that I might be asking you specific questions about this, this deal, which you can answer probably in short order. And now you can get a verbal commitment. Uh, you can now make use of that verbal commitment you got before. And so people who follow this process now can magically raise $250,000 in three days. Yeah, because I did all the work up front. Hmm. And that is a, a much, much more stress-free way to raise capital. So a couple questions on that. And, and I love that you're talking about this because you hear so many people online talk about syndications. They never really go through the nuts and bolts of it. So say you do have that deal. Uh, let's say you have, uh, you know, you've got a rock star agent. They, they've given you 60 days to close on this thing. Um, Whew, better for, from that point of the, well, first question is when you get those verbal commitments. So you say, basically, I have a deal very, very, sim you know, if I find a deal similar to this, would you be interested in this deal? They ask the questions, you kind of air, air that stuff out you find that actual deal. First of all, on from your experience, how many of those original yeses, you know, turn into, eh, you know, maybe the next one, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of percentage that falls off. And then secondly, when you actually have a deal and you do go back to these investors and you go to get those commitments, at what point are you actually changing hands in terms of, of the, the capital? Is it going into an escrow account? How does that, you know, the actual deal itself progress to, uh, to closing? Great questions. Okay, so, so when you get these verbal commitments, it depends on, on how intuitive you are about 
about the yes you're getting from investors. Here's the thing. People don't like saying no. So they're gonna, they want to say yes. Oh, yes, I'm in. Mm-hmm. And then when it's time to raise money, no one's in. Well, because you have happy years on, and when they told you yes, you took that as a yes, when in fact it was a no. So you have to add some, uh, some questions about how serious that yes is. You might ask questions, well, what kind of, where's the money coming from? Do you have to sell a house or your or a child or a car to get it? Or is this liquid, right? Mm. Is it in your IRA? Uh, you have to ask some qualifying questions. You have to give them permission to say no. Ah, it sounds like it's probably not for you. Is that, am I right about that? Oh, yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not really right for me. So you have to qualify. You got to take your happy years off a little bit. Sometimes I go a step beyond and I have them sign a letter of intent to invest. Oh, Jesse's a great guy. If he finds me the right deal, I'll invest with him. Hmm. Meaningless piece of paper. Oh, yeah, non-binding but, LOI. Yeah, it's not, uh, but, it, but you know, it gets a one more thing. Oh, I'm not, I'm not prepared to sign, sign yeah. anything right now. So you can qualify now. So when you have a first deal, here, here's what happens. You get a first deal and you get it under contract. You want to get under contract. And, if, uh, and at that point, you want to start the capital raising process. So here's what happens. You have a communication with your investors and you try to get what's called soft commits. This is essentially another verbal or, or somehow written verbal typically uh, of, hey, yes, I'm, I'm still in. I'm interested at 50,000, 75, 100,000, right? So you get your soft commits. And typically you want to get about, a, you know, 25 to 50% more soft commits than the money you actually need because some of those people won't actually uh, come through for various different reasons. I mean, some of it is, most of it is timing related, right? Mm. So you get these soft commits. And, um, and once you have the soft commits, while this is going on, while you're having conversations with your investors, uh, you then contract the, um, the attorney to draft the, what you call these PPMs or private placement memorandum and the legal documents. Now, typically, you don't want to do that until you're darn uh, sure that you're going to close on this deal, which typically happens after the property inspection comes back clean. You're like, okay, as far as I can tell, it's a green light. And mm. at that point, you can start spending money and not before because the attorney costs money. So while you're while while you're uh, talking about the, the the with the investors, and you're answering questions about the deal, the attorney is now working on the PPM, the legal docs, and then once they're done, you send those legal docs to your investors. They review and sign them, and once they sign them, they wire the money into an escrow account. So you want this all this stuff happening obviously before closing, but that's really it. Uh, and then once the money is in the escrow account, the uh, um, you just wait for for closing. So the, the closing itself is, is, a, is a relative non-event. You spend most of your time during closing dealing with the lender, filling out all their stuff, and, their, uh, and then when they go away, you're going to spend uh, you know, the rest of the time you know, hurting your, your investor, your cats, to, to closing because you know, inevitably half of them can't open an email or use a fax machine or scan or yeah. know how to read a text message. So you're chasing some investors. Some of them are vacation, you know, and so you're just making sure that everybody's following the process. So on that note, you, you, you mentioned the PPM and other legal documents. Could you just clarify, in my understanding of the PPM is the liability document. It's basically everything that could go wrong uh, that you're signing for. But is that, is that done in conjunction with what you often hear as a subscription agreement or is it, is it the same document? There's three documents. Uh, there's the operating agreement. The operating agreement is really the heart of everything because the operating agreement governs how the general partners, the sponsors, the whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. uh, governs what decisions they, they, they can make uh, and what require a vote of the limited partners. So it has voting rights and it. it has uh, profit distributions. It has various different, that is the actual company agreement. Mm-hmm. The PPM includes the, the, the operating agreement, which is why it's so daggone long. And then and it includes profile on, the, on all of the uh, members of the general partners, who they are, what deals they've done, uh, possible tax consequences and possible risks of the deal. So it is in that sense, it's a, it's a disclosure document required by the SEC. Now, the operating agreement has to be, and there's, there's a third one, the subscription agreement. A subscription agreement is essentially a questionnaire that does, it, it questions the investor about their ability to invest. Are they accredited? Are they non-accredited? Uh, and also, that's when they actually write down, oh, I want to I want to invest 50000 100000 whatever that that is. They have to sign that, and they have to sign the operating agreement. The private placement memorandum does not have to be signed. It is for informational purposes only. And it's probably because it's so long. No one wants to read that kind of stuff. But anyway, one should, of course, read that. Everything is in disclosed and also fees that the sponsors are going to charge are in there, um, how decisions are made, like I said. So yeah, those are three documents. And you just have to know enough 
uh, to know that you don't really have to know much in that because your SEC attorney handles all those things. When you call your SEC attorney, let's say your property inspection comes back clean. Okay, we're go for, for closing. You call your SEC attorney and they'll ask you a bunch of questions. Send me your contract, send me everything on your partners. Uh, how do you want to structure the deal? And, and they'll just ask you a bunch of questions. And then, mm-hmm. then they go away and, and do a bunch of stuff. And a few days later, they come back and they drown you in paper. And then you have to read it for, you know, for accuracy. So what I'm saying is a lot of people go, Oh, this sounds complicated. Yeah, but it's not your job to come up with that stuff. They'll yeah. interview you, they'll extract the information from you, and then they'll create the legal documents for it. Yeah, the reason I asked that is I actually met with uh, just a friend, he's a lawyer um, downtown here. And he was talking about how oftentimes the investors, the sponsors that he has is that he doesn't he no longer creates the PPM, um, aside from just kind of changing a few items. He's he was talking about the subscription and the operating agreement, but he was talking about the the private placement memorandum, the first time you do it for a new client, he was saying is kind of like the big uh, extraction, but I've heard differing opinions on this. So I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, that process. And maybe also, I know it's hard to estimate costs. It's obviously dependent on the deal, but you know, that is the oftentimes earnest money that the investor is putting in before actually receiving money from others. So yeah. How, how what are your thoughts on that? Kind of the lawyer, the lawyer component and, and those kind of documents. Yeah, well, look, I, I can't speak to how many uh, templates lawyers use. It seems like they keep reusing the same dangle thing over and over, and they still charge you the same price. So I don't know. You know, I, mm. I, so there's definitely boilerplate. The particulars yep. are, are, will vary from deal to deal, and so that will vary. But, yes, clearly, they're using some kind of, you know, template builder on their end to come up with the same thing but different. So mm. I can't speak to that. The cost is typically between ten and $20,000 for that. And, uh, and you build that, of course, into the deal and you get that back at closing if you close. This is why mm-hmm. I keep saying in the due diligence slash closing process, you want to defer spending money as much as possible. I had a conversation really with someone who lost 23000 on a, on a deal that didn't close. And when I, when I kind of asked him about it, he made all these mistakes where he ordered the appraisal right away. He, property, he hasn't even seen the property yet and he wants to get it done fast and he's spending all this money. But then he, I don't care what, he, he wasn't able to raise the, the money at the end mm. of the day. He just wasn't ready for it. And so why is he spending all this money? Or, you know, they discover some foundation issues or water issues or whatever. Black mold. Oh, no. Mm. You know, so the point is you want to defer spending money as much as possible. So hiring your attorney comes down the road. But when you're, when you're retaining the attorney, you are 98% you know, sure that you're going to close unless something wacky happens with a loan. That's like the only thing. And so, uh, yeah, you want to, so the probability is very high that you're going to get that money back at closing. Though having said that, that just definitely is a risk. If the deal does not close, that's why it's called risk capital, Hmm. right? That's why whoever puts up the risk capital is literally at risk. Yeah. Uh, And so whoever does that should get some kind of equity for putting that up if it's not yourself, but maybe an investor. Got it. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what you're doing in raising capital. But before I do, the last question on syndications I would have is when you are actually closing in our example here, um, are you typically trying to put put it in a, say, a numbered company or an LLC that you can assign to some future company? Or is it, you know, the company you put in is is the one you're tying your hands to? Uh, just, you know, I've gotten a few questions uh, through email uh, on the podcast that asked a little bit about that that component of it. Yeah, it's so funny because, uh, first of all, your attorney will advise you on all these things, and I'm not an attorney. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you, you bind, you ratify contracts with, you know, entity TBD, and people sign this. Oh, yeah. this is a binding contract. No, it's not. That's <laughs> weird, but it's done all the time, Jesse. Mm-hmm. So I don't really – or you use the entity that you use to, you know, that is on your business card, you know. Yeah. You know, you know Michael Blanc Investing LLC. Well, I don't actually maybe own any assets, or maybe I do. And so I – but the point is you're always creating a new entity, for apartment buildings. So the contract always has to be assignable. It's not because I want to wholesale it. No one really does that or very few people do that. It's not so it's, you can wholesale, but so you can assign it to another, another entity. That's why it's done. Yeah. So we, and you know, we do that on the brokerage side all the time. Uh, we have seen a couple, uh, large apartment assignments or wholesales, oh. but yeah, very, very rare, um, for that to happen. So Michael, let's, um, we've got about 10 minutes here. I know you got another, uh, another thing to get to. I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, the Nighthawk equity, um, basically kind of the raising capital, but also in addition to that, I want to talk a little bit about how you add value to others that are getting involved in real estate. I know you have training programs. I mean, the reason we're talking right now is that I found you online somewhere and I was like, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. Well, you can apply it in a variety of different ways. We, we add value to whoever your audience is, right? So we have really two main audiences who are interested in financial freedom with real estate. Those are your active investors, right? These are people who want to find deals, raise the money, 
And then there's these passive investors and they want the same thing, which is financial freedom. It's just that the, and the vehicle is the same. It's just that the strategy is different. The passive investor just wants to invest money and they want to generate cash flow and wealth and tax benefits so they can eventually replace and cover their expenses. And the active investor does it the same way, except that they're willing to work for it and get sweat equity for, for, for doing that. So the way that, you know, that we add value to those is that we try to educate them about what they want to know. So if you're interested about passive investing, well, I'm probably not going to give you blog articles and YouTube videos on how to find deals or analyze deals or raise money because you don't care. However, I'm going to sh share with you how you can use your IRA to invest, um, how you should analyze investment opportunities that you shouldn't compare the returns from one to another, and answer various questions like we're doing here on the investment process. That is now adding value to them. So uh, with and so doing, um, I, as a syndicator who am trying to raise capital, am able to attract more people, more investors that come to me because I'm, I'm, I'm adding value. And maybe they're attracted to my brand, my message about financial freedom. Like, oh, yeah, that's what I want. So they download something, something for free. And then I provide value to them. And this is what we teach on the Platform Builder framework as well. There's actually, there's actually a thing. Um, if you want, if you want to raise more capital, how do you how do you do that? You attract the right investor, and uh, by developing your brand and your your own story and your what we call your ideal uh, investor, which is also called your avatar, mm. and then you speak to them, right? You speak to them through various content, through blog posts, uh, video, podcasts, books, whatever whatever case may be, and you know what to say to them because you know your ideal avatar. You know uh, what they want. You know what they're afraid of. Uh, you know what their questions are. And so you speak to them through your content. Therefore, of course, um, uh, adding value and so doing, building trust with them. And when you have built trust with them, you can ask them to do something. Mm. In a general platform building where you can ask them to buy something or register something or read something, in the capital raising world, you're going to ask them to do something else. You're going to ask them to join your investment club, uh, which entails them filling out a short questionnaire and uh, schedule a call with you because you have to have a pre-existing substantive yep. relationship with them to buy by SEC laws. And so how do you do that? Well, you do it. Well, this is one way you do it. So you want to get to know these people. And the way you do is you ask them, are you enjoying my, my content? Great. Well, why don't you join the club and uh, you have a conversation with me. Once they're in, at that point, uh, you can then present them with live deals because they've now told you that I'm interested in, in live deals. Mm. So, um, and, and, and then you have a live deal and you do a live webinar. Uh, you have a soft commit form and some automations behind it. And so you automate the process. And so doing, you can literally raise millions in just a matter of days. We just raised 7.8 million in 24 hours. Um, and wow. others are doing the same thing as well. It's all due to the, to the power of the platform. And you can use it for raising capital. You can use it to sell online courses or, or fill rooms or sell books. The platform building process is always the same. It's just that the nuance is based on how you're using it. The content you're using um, are a little bit different, but the, the, the principles and the automations behind it are always the same. So the platform, um, just a couple words on when you say platform, what you mean as opposed to you know, maybe what somebody thinks they, they're hearing. Yeah, platform for me is basically used for marketing and, and sales and influencing people. And so that's what we're talking about. A lot of times historically when you hear platform, uh, some people think about software platforms, yeah. you know, maybe. <clears throat> and um, I know that and maybe you know that, but most people don't even know what a platform is, maybe a mm. stage or something. And that's more, it's, uh, it's more like a stage. You're building a stage and you're, and, and you're putting the right audience in the seats and then you're delivering the message that is relevant to them where the benefits are clear to them and once they start nodding their head because they learned something, you can then ask them to do something. In this case, for capital raising, we're going to ask them to invest with us. In so doing, they get a benefit, which is cash flow, wealth creation, and tax benefits. You get the benefit of raising capital, and that means you can then grow your own real estate business. Gotcha. All right, Michael, we have uh, just a few questions we typically like to end with. Uh, we ask everybody on the show um, if you're ready for those. Born ready. All right. So first of all, just in your uh, real estate kind of career journey, whatever you want to call it, um, were there mentors that, um, that you had had in the past that really kind of made you what you are today or kind of put you in the space that you're in and really excelled what you're doing currently? So today I have lots of mentors, either in person or virtual mentors. Mm. Uh, but back in the day, I didn't. That was my main mistake. I didn't have a mentor for my restaurant business. I didn't have a I did have a mentor for the house flipping business. I didn't have a mentor for my apartment building uh, business. And had I had those things, I would have avoided the major mistakes and accelerated 
their results, uh, specifically around the restaurant uh, as well. So uh, now I try to get a, a mentor uh, for various different parts of my life, depending on what I'm trying to do. You know, it could be a, it could be a business coach, it could be a health coach. Uh, or, or spiritual coach, and not all of them are paid coaches. A lot of them are, you know, in books and and mm. and podcasts, right? You 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 come to someone that you really enjoy, you really resonate with. You just consume all of their all of the content. So, uh, and then you know, I'm I'm in a couple of masterminds, just like I teach everybody else to get into master. You need a peer group. You don't just yep. need a mentor. Very important. Mm. You also need a peer group as well. Okay. Well, you're clearly cheating because the next question is what are some of the favorite books that you've had? You mentioned Robert uh, Kiyosaki at the top of the hour. Are there any other uh, books that really kind of helped you through, uh, through the process? There's a couple of books. Uh, One of the people I really enjoy is Hal Elrod. He spoke at our Dealmaker Live conference uh, last year. Really great guy. Um, He's got two great books, The Miracle Morning, which I really enjoyed and implemented several years ago. I know you're going to ask me about the best habit. That's the one. Uh, And and then number two is his newer book, Miracle Equation, which I really enjoy because it kind of stands goal setting on its head. So I really Mm -hmm. enjoy that. Uh, Also, the Gary Keller book, The One Thing. You put them Mm -hmm. together and it's a very powerful uh, way to uh, accomplish things that are actually really important to you. Okay. Well, the two I've kind of, uh, I, I love for masters in business and Bloomberg, uh, and that is something that you are pessimistic about right now and something that you're optimistic about right now. I am an optimistic realist. Got it. That's kind of what I am. So, I, you know, back in the day when I got in the restaurant business, I had my giant happy years on and nothing could possibly go wrong. So I'm personally signing, you know, personally guaranteed leases in the, in the millions. Oh yeah, that's mm. the fault clause. I don't, who cares about that? Girl? You know? And so I'm a little more cautious now. So I, I, I'm not pessimistic at all. I think there's always an opportunity regardless of what's going on. You just have to have your eyes open. Okay. And my personal favorite, just being a car guy, what was Michael Blanc's first car? Oh my gosh, my first car. Make a model. Kind of, it was some kind of Ford hatchback. It was awful. And I, <laughs> I, I had like someone rear-ended me on a New Jersey turnpike uh, going up there. And that was the end of the end of that. But at least I had a car. This was in college, sure. right? So, For sure. hey, shoot, it gave me some amount of freedom. Yeah, I think we all have the awful part in common, but hey, you're 16 and you had wheels. That's right. Um, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. Um, what I'd love to do is just for you to talk to our listeners and say where they can reach you aside from just typing Mon- Michael Blanc in Google. Uh, but is there any, is there any space that, uh, that is preferable or? Yeah. The website know. is the Michael Blanc. That's B L A N K. The Michael Blanc. Cause there can only be one. Oddly enough, there's more than me, but there's only one of me. All right. So the that's Michael, Michael Blanc. Blanc. He, yeah, he's yeah, trouble. Yeah. yeah those, those yeah. whatever. I don't know. So we have a lot of free resources out there. We have the blog, we have a YouTube channel, we have the apartment building investing podcast, uh, and then if people are ready to, in, uh, we have the book, uh, Financial Freedom with, with uh, Real Estate Investing, the yellow book here that's on Amazon, mm-hmm. Financial Freedom with Real Estate. And then if they're ready to invest, we have some online courses called The Ultimate Guide to Buying Apartments. We have a mentorship program where you can work one-on-one with people. We have the Platform Builder uh, program where people can learn how to build this platform raising capital as well. So try to have something for everyone who is interested in financial freedom with real estate. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today has been Michael Blanc. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure, Jesse. Thanks for being, thanks for having me on.